Hey guys, how are you doing? So today we're going to speak with the Liz Clark. Liz Clark, oh my goodness, how many things can I say about her? She is a change agent. She understands how to powerfully navigate um, really volatile situations and de-escalates them. Oh, there she is. Hey Liz, I'm going to go get her. Let's go to this IGTV live thing. Um, so let's welcome Liz. <laughs> wow. Hello. Hotness. <laughs> wow. Can you, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Okay. Excellent. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you see me? I can see you. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little fuzzy. Yes. Okay, Liz, I wanted, I just want to tell you, thank you so much for being here with me today. You and I had the pleasure of meeting. I'm thinking actually I did the math. I think it's like four years ago, actually, <laughs> but we yeah. only had a brief like encounter, but there was yes. a connection. Yes. Years go on, life is lived and we get reconnected and I'm learning so much about you. You are a genius. <laughs> you are. Thank you. you. I called you a change agent, someone who understands how to navigate highly volatile and ever-changing situations and paces. Mm -hmm. um, I would love for you to take us through. What do you do, Liz? First, I always ask, where are you? I am in um, the Poconos, Pennsylvania. So hey. um, it is about 90. No, I'm joking. You don't <laughs> it's about 90 minutes outside of New York City. Um, and Philadelphia, so we're kind of like in the middle, but it's uh, just a lovely, and I'm also in my backyard, so. It looks <laughs> In my pretty. backyard, in the Poconos. Hey, Aurora. Yeah, I decided, decided it looks, to do uh, this really outside green. today. Yeah, I love, 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 love this backyard. It, it has so much life, <laughs> so much I life love and love out here. So now, Liz, would you tell us what you do? Yes. Um, Depending on the day and who I'm talking to, I do a lot of things, but professionally, I'm a business owner and a project management consultant, but I also think I, I've been told I also have a personality, so that's what sets me apart in my field. You have a huge, <laughs> beautiful personality. Um, yeah, so project management, um, I work with large corporations primarily. I've done some side journeys of doing project management for smaller companies, but basically mm -hmm. a company will bring me in to help execute or develop and execute a project that their full-time employees don't have the bandwidth to do. So sure. I come in for a short, not always short, but like a specific scope of work to focus on and help, help lead that project, help, uh, first of all, usually do feasibility to determine if it's like a viable project, plan it, execute it, wrap it up, all those, all those fun things. Okay. That's Thank what I do professionally. That's what you do professionally. <laughs> yes. Tell me, when you and I were talking about what we wanted to talk about today, um, what stood out was your, I mean, because I think you've been in this situation that we, that's where we learn from. We learn from our experiences yeah. that you really have a handle on dealing with volatile and ever changing dynamic situations. Yeah. So can you kind of take us into that world of, um, maybe tell us a couple stories or a story, whatever you want to, that showed how this became something that's important for you and also something you learned how to navigate. Yes. <laughs> yes, I can do that. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm a person who has a lot of stories to tell. And so one of the reasons why I had to focus on change and dealing with change is that I wanted to try to help have a focusing thing to talk about. Yeah. We could, you know how we do. We could just go off and oh, talk yeah, about girl, everything. We can end up talking about <laughs> And then when Christopher Columbus landed in the Bahamas, I right? know, I, I know. know. <laughs> and we still have a day that's named after him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll try to keep it short. You don't um, have to. Do, so I am a person who um, had a very chaotic childhood. Mm -hmm. And chaotic meaning lots of change, uh, substance abuse, addiction, and, and different members of the family. Mm -hmm. um, some transiency in terms of where I lived, lots of moving around and different things. So lots of, lots of chaos. And I remember being a little girl, actually, I was a little bit of an older little girl, like maybe around nine or 10. My mom could tell you the exact age. 
where I, I had a little bit of a fit, which was uncommon for me because I was usually pretty reserved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was upset. I was angry. And I told my mom, when I get to be an adult, I am going to buy one house and I am going to live in it for the rest of my life. That was the extent of how I could verbalize how frustrated I was with the amount of And how of much you need stability. How much I, I'm longing for stability. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that was like, th that was all I could, that was like my biggest vision at the time was like, yeah. I need just one house that I'm never going to move from. And it is so ironic to me. And I don't know, like we ask these questions, is it, is it our experiences that shape us or are we shaped by, are, are we creating Nurture our reality? Versus nature. Yeah, like all of these things. But it's ironic to me that as my life progressed, I continued to be in seasons of high volatile change in every single aspect of my life. My parents are divorced and remarried. My dad remarried again. You know, familially, there was a lot of change moving around, changing states, changing schools. Um, professionally, um, lots of change that occurred in my life. I went to school, um, to college. I was the first one in my family to go and finish college. Mm. And um, I got, ended up, started off as an education major, ended with English and philosophy as a pre-law student because I was going to go to law school. So That's right. lots of different changing visions. Praise um, the Lord, you didn't. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that, we need to have that conversation probably. And um, got married when I was 21, had Ooh. four kids back to back. So I was, wow. married. I was four kids in six years. So I was like pregnant, breastfeeding, pregnant, breastfeeding. You're pregnant. like 27 and you have four kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I well, I had the, I had the first, at, yeah, I had the first at 22 and the, I got married at 21, had my first kid at 22, had my last kid at, at 28. So yeah. That's amazing. Um, I wasn't and, even a mom yet. That's, 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 that's okay. That's probably a better thing. I was 32. Ooh, I am... and cried, girl, cried when I found out I was pregnant. Like I was 16 <laughs> years old and I got pregnant in the back seat of the car. I was like, I can't oh, believe no. this. Can you believe I'm pregnant? And now I look, I was like, girl, you were 32 years old. You should be thanking Jesus. <laughs> <But> anyway. <laughs> no, absolutely. So um, anyway, I landed in project management. And project management was one of those things that I was already doing, but then someone said, oh, this is what you are. You're a project manager. <laughs> right. When I was already doing it on a job. Yeah. And, um, and then I- Because it wasn't one of those things that in college you knew, that you knew existed. So you go, you know what I want to do when I grow up? I want to be a project manager. There's no. so many careers like that. Like yeah. when you start living life and you're yeah. like, you, what do you do? And you're right. like, they're like, yeah, so what I do is I do this consulting thing. And you're like, <laughs> Who would have known that even existed? So go on. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, um, and also, I recently went and spoke at Lehigh University. I was a guest lecturer to a group of uh, upperclassmen at, in one of their, um, it was an IS class, but they were talking about learning project Sizzle management Fry software. Burn. What's that? Sizzle Fry Burn. <laughs> Don't let, I, um, you're, you're, you're trying to like skate on me. I recently, you know, guest oh. lecturer at Lehigh, you, that's a big flipping deal, lady. Well, it's because I know the professor and he was, he was burnt out and he needed a guest lecture. <laughs> so that's what it was. <laughs> well, no one has asked me to guest lecture. So how about that one? <laughs> so here's this group full of upperclassmen and I was selling that I was talking about my career in project management and how it, you know, has the opportunities that it has opened for me. And they're all looking at me like, is she for real? So like just a little side journey here is like when, after I started having babies, I was involved with a religious uh, group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they would call themselves Christians. But and, you're and more like a cult? It was very, um, I, I it would almost go there. Yeah. Okay. And, and they had a very firm belief. Mm -hmm. And I was very young um, and looking for that stability, right? And they had a very firm belief that women should not be working outside the home. They should be keepers at home, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And so I was really looking for belonging and acceptance and stability and all of those things. So I really fell into this group and, um, and we ended up on welfare because I had a college degree and was making good money, got laid off and then felt like I can't go back to work. I was pregnant, all these things. I should stay so home. I should stay I home. Afford it. Even if I get, yeah, absolutely. And my husband was doing it the best that he could, but he was also deployed. 
on and off and they, they don't make good money when you're even when you're deployed when they when he had deployed it was like oh, we get a like a little bonus like you were almost out of the poverty range when he got deployed like my husband actually really put sad. His life on the line <laughs> isn't that really sad that is sad yeah oh my god so um, another reason why i don't want to be in the armed forces <laughs> no, i'm joking but i mean that's why i'm so amazed yes. at you know i i truly am that person who when i'm on the plane um, this is all pre COVID, but when I'm on the plane, I'm like, Hey, and I see an officer dressed, but I can tell that they're an officer, girl or guy. Thank you so much for your service. I really am that nerd because I know they're doing something that I have no interest in doing, yeah. but I have every interest in receiving the benefits of what they do. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, so I, I, I went down this road and we were on welfare for five years. So wow. I was having babies. I was learning how to cook on $30 a week uh, with, for four people and like learning all this whole stuff. And this one day, there's a whole nother side st story to this. But one day I was just like, that is enough. Like from the depths of my soul, it was like, that is enough. We, right. ran, out of, we ran out of food. We were at a food bank. It was a horrible experience. And I was just like, I, I really want to be like godly and holy and all this stuff. But like this, this is enough. But I, I, can't, I can't do this. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, through a series that I like to put myself in a room for three days, I was like, I don't got to figure this out. I don't want to be sinful. I don't want to be some Jezebel, which is what I was being called. But <laughs> I want to like my children oh my to God. eat and I want to, I don't want to live in public housing anymore. And I want to be a self-sufficient person. And I have a college degree and you know, like all these things. So, you know, what? I just real quick, that's really blowing my mind. You know, just recently I saw a meme that went across and it said, um, if I think it said it, if Maya Angelou had been um, arrested or murdered at the age of 20, you know, killed at age 20, died, at 20, she would have died a prostitute. She would have died an unwed mother. She would have died. Like, it was a lot of things she would have died um, right. as. And so what's really phenomenal to me is I know, I know you. Not everybody who's watching knows you. But you truly are one of the brightest, sharpest thinkers, and specifically with regards to even processes and understanding how to create processes and where there is a pattern. Like, I cannot imagine the intellectual capacity, the emotional and spiritual capacity that I know you hold that that person was on welfare. And so the reason why I want to, I'm emphasizing that is, it is always easy to discredit and discount the value of a person mm -hmm. when they're doing something or they're in a situation that you never would have, um, that, you, that you think is like beneath. These, these are lower in blah, blah, blah people. But here I want people to understand, Liz is a genius. She's <laughs> brilliant. No, I'm not being kind. I'm not being kind. You are a genius. You're brilliant. Your clarity of thought and processes is honestly, I've never really seen it before. I know if anybody hired me to do your position, they'd be very sad, very sad. <laughs> they'd be like, oh, mm -mm, get this girl out of here. So it's just, I want people to hear this woman with this value was on welfare. Yes. Yes. And actually, that was the deal that I made with God. Because I said in those three, three days, I was still breastfeeding my youngest. And I only, that's all I did for three days. I breastfed mm -hmm. him and I journaled and I cried and I sobbed my heart out. And I said, this deal that I made with God was like, why did you put this in me? Mm -hmm. If I'm just, if I, if I can't do for my family, if I can't get out there and, and use it, like I, I, why, why is this in me? And I, and I had to, the only thing that didn't fit was that this narrative that had been handed to me that because of my gender, <laughs> that I was not allowed to participate right. in, this, in this realm. And I was like, that's not, God didn't tell me that. I don't feel that in my heart. I'm not sure so that. So, so, so I had to just recognize, and a little bit what I want to talk about with regard to change in that moment, that was one of my first time, not really my first times, but maybe my first time as an adult, maybe my second time as an adult, of doing this deep identity work. And, and what I mean by that is this is like a background, this is like a spiritual practice for me now. But at the time, it only happened when I was in crisis. And, and it's, it, it, it goes by many names to people, you know, 
all over the place. This ties into the change stuff, I promise. No, no, go ahead. What does it look like? Recognizing, recognizing that we have certain um, unconscious assumptions that we have about people, about ourselves, about our lives. We have certain things that get down into an identity level, some of which stem from trauma. Some of them are coping mechanisms that we have created because of trauma that we experienced in our childhood. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes there are things that are deep identity because we have latched onto someone else's narrative like I did in my 20s. I had an identity that to be a godly woman, I needed to be this keeper at home who didn't use my words, <laughs> couldn't pray in church and couldn't do these things. And I tried oh, that so hard. So wrong. Shay, you know I tried so hard, but I tried so hard at 20 and 21 and 22 I and 23. Did. I tried I so hard. And I was just like, I am really bad at this. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm really, I mean, listen to how crazy it is. God, I am really bad at coaching all the gifts and talents you've given me. Um, help me to do that. Do you understand? Like, that's the insanity of it. Like, exactly. you're really bad at it because everybody is born on this planet for a reason. Mm-hmm. You're here for a reason. And mm-hmm. dare I say, you're here to bring us something. So mm-hmm. bring it. Give it to us. And when you're not giving it to us, we are deprived. We are deprived. Yes. The larger we are in society. And consequently, you, the giver, are deprived. Yes. A part of the gift is the giving, is the bringing yes. it to us. Yes. Yes. What you said. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> so that deep work where I had to recognize this baseline identity that I have latched onto has an error. (laughs) Mm. There is something not working here. And my choices here are to either uproot this identity and try something else or keep with it and continue having this experience. But it is, it is ridiculous for me to think that I'm going to have a different output. It's five years now, five years now I am in this space and nothing is changing and we are running out of food. I can't feed my children done. I come from, from Italian people. We don't, Mm. we don't, we don't not feed our children. Right, <laughs> not, no. not that I think anybody, not that I think anybody doesn't, but like that no. was, my grandmother was like, get saved, serve Jesus and feed people. Like those were That's the right. priorities. That was the. <laughs> hey, I lived in Italy before. And oh, I you? know you can't walk into a house without food being offered to you. Yes. Food yes. is offered to you. That's it. And, and, and if you say like no. This, right. You're rude. No, it doesn't, doesn't mean any, well, it doesn't mean anything either. It's like, <laughs> no, I'm, and they're I'm not good. like I little do. snacks. Yeah, no. They're like, for real, like, Manja, man, you're like, right. how you're like, big do you want me to get? Like, <laughs> like you, you like providing like 12 meals in the middle of the day. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I ended through a series of things. I ended up in a technical writing position for a pharmaceutical company and outperformed expectations and started managing these standard operating procedures I was asked to write. I had never worked in that industry. I had never been involved in that, but I outperformed. They said it would take a year and I did it in three months to get these 200 standard operating procedures done. Nerd. And, um, I know. And I thought <laughs> I, my biggest worry, because I still had that like scarcity. I was like, I'm going to do this for my family. I, I like worked a million hours a week. I was like locked myself in the rooms to read all of their ETOPS and technical documents. So I'm like, I have to, I have to, I had this fire in the belly. Yes. And I, my biggest fear with getting it done in three months was that um, they were going to fire me because <laughs> I was. And a their expectation was, if we could just get it done in twelve months. Right. right. So he looked at me and he said, "Do you know how long it was that we we, we the managed time. to do this? We had planned for." And I said, "No." And he said, "We we planned that this would take a year, and you just did it in three months. You're not a technical writer; you're a project manager." And I was like, "So are you going to fire me?" <laughs> like, oh. That was still my. What is that? How old you, are, you? are you? I was twenty eight. Yeah. I was 28. My, my baby was still, wasn't even one yet. Um, so I was a real Jezebel because I didn't even nurse him <laughs> to a year. <laughs> I put him on formula and everything. <laughs> you, je- you hussy. You Jezebel you hussy. Tell you what. <laughs> um, and then I got a job offer out of the, from that company, making more money than I'd ever made in my life as a project manager in their engineering department. I was like, <laughs> how do you feel? How do you feel the moment you are gi- you're given this job offer and you're making more money than you've ever made in your life? How did you feel in that moment? 
I felt like it was a joke, like it was happening to someone else. I like knew I, that. I felt, That's why I asked the question. Yeah. I felt like it was a mistake. Mm-hmm. That, that the You'd offer be found letter, out? You'd yeah, be found out and they'd be total, like, oh. Total imposter syndrome. Total what imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. When I saw the offer and the, and the, how they're like, I was like, I kept looking up to see if they got my name right. I was like, this has got to be a copy paste <laughs> error. <laughs> Someone else has got to be a you mistake. <laughs> and then, um, but it wasn't. And, of course and it wasn't. With full, and we had just now a year had gone by. I'm telling, this was not the story I meant to tell today, but this is the story I'm telling. So a year, it was October, 2006 when um, I had that, this is it. I am done. We, I got to figure this out. Three days in the, in the tunnel of like secret place, like got to figure this out. Got to make a difference. Got It was October, 2007. So one year later that I, um, that we moved into our new home. So we were off of welfare. We had paid off all of our debt. We were off all forms of welfare. We were off everything. And I got that offer. Um, you know, so, the reason why I want to just pause on that offer real quick no, it's good. is because I know that there will be people who will have opportunities like this come to them or have had opportunities like this come to them after great turmoil and um, like a downward trajectory. And what is clear to me is the reason why you thought it was a joke is because you had also grown accustomed to your life feeling like a focaccia mess. Yeah. And what I've seen in my own self, and you, you, you tell me if this is true for you, is sometimes I have to look at my behavior and, and realize that I have not only grown accustomed to life being a certain way, but I also kind to kind of want to continue creating situations yes. that would most align with that. 100%. Because it, it, subconsciously, I'm not doing it mm-hmm. consciously, subconsciously, because it is what I know. For example, what I, I was talking to my mother about this the other day, and I am someone who is full of hope. I am a hoper. I will believe. I will have faith. I will declare. I will like yell to myself in the closet, I will believe. But I had to do internal work to also understand that I need to be someone who could receive. Mm. Otherwise, I would continually create situations that I had to believe and Mm -hmm. hope and pray Mm -hmm. and declare because that is the place where I was comfortable with. So I just wanted people to understand the reason why I knew you were going to feel like an imposter. I knew you were going to feel like it was a joke and that it wasn't for you because it was outside of your realm of normalcy and what you subconsciously were craving in that Mm -hmm. moment was the normalcy of what you knew, even though it wasn't good. Yep. That's amazing. So right on. And the moment that shifted that for me in that particular story was the person that I was reporting to at the time as a contractor. So I hadn't accepted this offer yet. I went to him and I said, this can't be right. Right. And I said, it. I just, I was just transparent. I was like, this can't be right, which probably you shouldn't have done, but I did. And um, I didn't actually show him the offer letter, but I said, I got the offer letter. Have you seen it? He said, yeah, I signed off on it. I said, are you sure it's correct? And he, he opened it on his screen. I couldn't see it. He was like, is, it, is, is this the number at the top? I'm like, yeah. He's like, no, it's correct. And I, I said, I, I, I just feel like I'm, I didn't say imposter, but I basically said, you know, I don't have an engineering degree. I don't know that I'm a, a good fit for this team. And he and I had been working together very closely with the whole team. Mm-hmm. And he looked at me and he said, Liz, you are the only person on this team in the past six months who has made my life easier. Glory! <laughs> He's like, I would pay you if I could, if I was HR, I would pay you twice this without batting an eye. You are an excellent investment. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God. And then I want to pause on him too. Yeah. It's because he represents a figure that I want other people to lay mm-hmm. hold of. Yep. I believe that there will always be, I believe in God. So I believe God will always have someone who will interact with your story, your narrative mm-hmm. to yep. declare your value to you, who will be a helper to you. Who yep. will come be like, let, um, just so you know, I see you. Yep. I double the value of what you double yourself to be. Yep. And I raise it by 10. <laughs> you know what I yep. mean? Like, yep. I think we need to see, I think everybody at some point in their lives need someone, and it has to be also in my opinion, 
someone outside of your family of origin. It has to be someone mm -hmm. else. Yeah. Yep. And I find that's who this guy is. He, yep. he comes and he joins your story. And yep. for a moment, he's your guy. And yep. he's the person who recognizes your value and helps you see, girl, do you see who you are to us? Yep. And he has no, he ain't trying to be nice to you. He has no reason to be nice to you. Absolutely. I love what Aurora just said to put that on what my business she card. She said, put it on my business card. Liz Clark is an excellent investment in your business. <laughs> <laughs> but but what but what his words did so so this process that I'm talking about with change which we probably won't get to is that I took his words away and I began to understand that I began to like consciously become aware mm -hmm. of the plurality of experience Ooh! and it was the first time in my life I knew it like I, knew I need you it. to break that down for people. Plurality okay. of experience. The what first time in my life that I like became cognitively aware of the plurality of experience, meaning that when I walk into a room and you walk into a room and this other guy walks into a room and we walk into a room and we have a meeting, we have all had four different experiences. Absolutely. That are wildly different mm -hmm. because of our preconceived notions, because of our distractions, because of our our filters because of the way that we're seeing and experiencing and showing up and because of what happened right before we came into the room, a whole bunch of stuff. Because of what we want to get out of the meeting, because right. where our self-interest is, because of right. what we, because what we care about, because right. of all of the things, but also in that moment, it was not just about, um, it was not just about understanding plurality of experience, but it was understanding that my experience of me, it's not the only experience of me. Oh, other... I wait a minute. <laughs> Repeat that, girl. That is that good. My experience of me is not the only experience of me. So what I, all of this insecurity and worry and scares, fear and scarcity and all the neurotic craziness that I was bringing, and I was hiding all of that. Like, it was all right. within. But I was, it was showing up and manifesting as hustle. Hustle, right. hustle, hustle, okay? Right. But all they saw was a person who made their lives easier, who coordinated and removed obstacles, who made things visual so people could see what the problems were so we could solve them, who was getting right. out there. And, 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 and so I began to do this practice of, and really what, what ended up happening three years later is I started my own business, which I still run today in Project Management Consultant. Um, and as much as I made in that first offer in 2007, by 2010, I was making more than double that. And I was ratcheted up into the six-figure range and beyond. Can I so, be your cousin, baby, and borrow a couple dollars, please? <laughs> yes. Um, so my, my point, what that day did for me was uh -huh. be, I began to see myself. For certainly, my experiences were valid. My feelings were valid. Yes. My, the way I was experiencing the world was valid. I needed to feel my feelings. I needed to do all of that. I'm not discounting any of that. But as a professional and as a business person, and I even started doing it in my family, was recognizing that the, the me that people saw was different than the me that I was experiencing. And they didn't know if I was insecure unless I was showing insecurity. Um, I'm not trying to echo or argue an idea that we should wear a mask to other people. That's but not I what am, I'm hearing. Right. But what I am saying very, very clearly is that often when you think you're being a certain way, other people are seeing a different thing. That's exactly what I'm hearing. You're and not saying to, right. you're not promoting wearing a mask. What you're saying right. though, this is actually in fact what's happening regardless of whether or not you Absolutely. are wearing a mask. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That people are having different, different experiences of you than you are having of yourself in yes. any given situation. Yes. Know that. Yes. Now, now that we know it, I always talk about when we sit in the seat of awareness, we sit in the seat of power. Now yes. that we are aware of that, we can move from a power position. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I'm in a weakened space internally, like my world, you know what's going on in my world. My husband has kidney disease. He had a kidney transplant, it's not going well. Uh, we're weeks away from, you know, dialysis. I mean, like all of this stuff. And, so, and these are real things that are happening in my world. And these are real weakened um, positions to my soul. But I'm, I see through other people what they say, how they're experiencing me. Yeah. They're experiencing me on a very powerful level. And it's not denying that I have power, but it's also recognizing the plurality of experience that you yes. experience me different than what I'm experiencing me. Yes. Yes. I love yes. it. Yes. So, here so is, here's the rabbit hole. 
that starts to get down when it comes to dealing with rapid change in your life is that there are times when you're, you're taking something. Mm, Let me start again. When we do this work, this deep work of recognizing, having those epiphanies and recognizing that there is identity work that has to be done and whatever you call it. Some people call it shadow work. Some people just call it uh, growing personal growth, whatever it is. But like that moment when I recognized that that narrative that had been handed to me by the church in my early twenties was not serving me. That moment when I realized when that man said to me, you made my life easier. And I recognized that there is a different me in the room (laughs) that Uh is being perceived. Those moments, those moments where I get to like recognize and, and I'll tell you what, from that moment with that man in that office, I was able to negotiate deals that I never, the, that insecure me never would have been able to negotiate later on in business in, in rooms that I didn't even understand what was happening. I didn't understand the terminology or the language. I was able to hover and be like, they are perceiving me in a way that is different than I am perceiving me in this moment. And I... <laughs> They're getting a different Liz than the Liz that I currently am sitting with on the inside. And I'm just going to go with that Liz that yes. they are experiencing. Yes, I'm going to be the Liz that they aspire me to be. Yes, uh, Lori, that's um, who I am. And so, anyway, so doing that work, that deep, deep, deep work, what happens is when we experience change, uh-huh. we get so, like, mad about the change, but we don't take the time to recognize what is the baseline underlying assumption Mm-hmm. that still exists within you that is giving you a problem with that change because change means a deviation from something. That's good. Ch- I think you need to say that again, though. Change means a deviation from something. Right. So if we are deviating from something, what are we deviating from? And I don't mean the word deviating in like a negative sense. I just no. mean there's a change. It's, right. a, it's a delta. There's a, there's mm-hmm. a thing that was That's and now right. there's, there's a, a thing that is. And what we tend to do is we only start focusing on this thing that is, this thing that is, the thing that is, it's really making me mad. It's making me so mad that this thing, this new thing is. And we don't take the time to find out what is the thing that was, that we're missing, that we're grieving, that we're upset about losing. Mm. And is there an underlying identity issue that is no longer serving us, that is really at the root of it? What if there's a thing underneath that is saying to us, hey, it's time to let go of this thing. And you're really, really mad and all this emotion that you're getting stuck in the fact that you're mad about this change or you're upset about it or whatever is really just masking over the fact that you need to, you need to take some time to go within and investigate. Do you have an example of that in your life? Oh, (laughs) yes. Yeah. Give us an example because I want people to get that. I think what you're saying is something that is absolutely impactful and I believe it's one of those things that can help people live a clearer, less encumbered life. So yes. give us an example of that. So the example I prepared for that is a professional example, which can also be a social example, right? Okay. But it, it also like was socially ha- happened a lot. So when I was, uh, after I had been hired by that company in Ohio, um, and I was, I kept getting promoted to these bigger and bigger project management things that were way over my head that I was just like, I am learning. I am, I am in the tunnel, I am learning. Um, there was a particular contract team and there was a particular person on that team that just, we did not get along. Ever, ever had someone you didn't get along with professionally? Oh um, my God, yes. <laughs> I mean, and it was, was I, one stank lady. Kidding, go on. <laughs> I, was known, I was known on the site. I knew everybody's name. I would always, I was, I wasn't like bubbly, but I just would always call everybody by their first name. I made eye contact. I was determined to know people. And the fact that I couldn't get along with this person, I was professional, but it was very clear in meetings that there was a rub between me and this yeah. person. I and other, like that. and there was a friend of mine who was a co-leader on a certain thing. And I kept complaining to him about it. Like every day complaining, 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 complaining about this person. And he would listen. And he also was not a fan of this person. So, you know, it was, it, it was obviously all so the we person. So we had an alliance. The person. <laughs> it was obviously all the other person and not right. all me. Her problem. Um, his problem. Mm-hmm. Um, but at one point, I think it maybe a couple weeks into this, and it wasn't so much like I was bringing it up a lot. It was just like every time something would happen or go wrong on the project, I found a way to blame this person. Yeah. So I would always bring it up. So at one point, this, um, per, the, my friend, my co-leader said to me, I understand that this person is 
not performing, but I need to talk to you because this anger and frustration that you have at this person is holding you back from the leader we need you to be. Woo! And I, 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 rem I was remember exactly where I was standing in the hallway with the light when he said this to me, like, I could feel like I'm there right now. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is a moment. <laughs> I'm <laughs> having a moment. Because what I recognized in that moment was that all of my anger was balled up in the change that this person was representing to my project. This, this person yeah. was making trouble, was causing me to question things. And I had a very efficient thing going on. And this person right. was asking questions at the non-designated times. And <laughs> which I clearly allowed from everybody else, but I would get mad when this person did it. Um, and what was, so all of my anger, all of my emotion was all tied up in being angry at the change, angry at this person. And what, I really, needed, what I really needed to do was go within and figure out why this person, what was my baseline? What was my underlying expectation, my underlying assumption about what I expected that was being violated? Mm -hmm. what was the what was the level of identity that on some level was being violated by this person now when I say violated I don't mean that that person intended to violate me I get it but it was reading as violation <laughs> somewhere deep inside of me there was an anger and, the, and there's another way to say it too for those people who can't hear the yeah. violation what pain point is mm -hmm. that person triggering yeah what is it yes that what is it because what you're saying is it's never about the watermelon. Yes. That's another long story. It's yes. never about what it looks like it, it, you think right. it is. It's yes. always about something deeper. So even if you can't, even if the word violates, right. violates something in your brain, what she's talking about is what thing was this person triggering? Because that's what? the place of growth. Yeah. That, because that's the place of transformation. Exactly. If yes. you just stuck with what it was, you're just going to be pissed off at them until Jesus comes. Yes, exactly. And let me tell you what, the emotional energy, and if you want to call it spiritual energy, the energy that you have to deal with the stuff going on in your life right. is, I believe, very carefully meted out. You have enough energy to deal with the stuff in your life. You're but, if you, if you, but if you allow this little mirror, like light, like somebody's holding up a mirror just to get in your eyes, and you're, oh, you just keep looking at the mirror. You're like, oh, 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 instead of like actually taking that energy and dealing with what is going on inside of you, you have nothing left at the end of the day. You're exhausted. Ooh. That's not life giving. It's not life giving to just sit there and keep being mad at that person. I'm just so mad. Can you believe the way he talked to me? Can you believe that tone of voice? Can you believe he cut me off? Like all of those things matter. You're and it's blowing okay. it, girl. Blowing the mind. This is, no, I'm not kidding. I'm not using hyperbole. Okay, I'll be this more is life. <laughs> this is life changing stuff this is stuff that people could do in their everyday lives to help them yeah. we have a finite amount of energy time and strength yes yes finite amount yes we will always have people who will crop up in our life who will hit pain points from our history of our past mm -hmm. they will violate what we thought it was yes and they're hitting that thing and until we recognize what they're hitting, two things I know for sure will happen. Them mofos will keep showing up in your life until you get that damn lesson. <laughs> yes, they will. Yes, okay? they will. So you're going to keep having that lesson. Keep new day, up. they'll just show up with a new face. All new, day long. New body, the they'll just keep showing up. And the second thing you're teaching me is you will be depleted of energy. You will be depleted. Absolutely. So what you're going to choose? Yeah. Deal with it, do yep. the work, or keep d dealing with the repetition of this person showing up and yes. keep having low energy because it is yes. focused on the thing and not what the thing is causing you to feel. Exactly. Yes. Girl, you are. <laughs> mm -mm. So I won't get into all that I found when I actually, I listened to my friend, Greg, and I went with him later that night and mm -hmm. I, and I found some things. What'd and you if, find? I, I found some things, but the biggest thing that I found that I'm going to talk about right now is, is the misunderstanding that the person I was then, I think I, was, I think I was 30 at this point, that the person I was then at 30 was the only person I was going to be, and anybody who challenged me was wrong. So what I mean by that 
is that there were some trauma informed root issues going on behind my hustle and my this and my that and my all of this stuff. There were some trauma informed issues from real Ooh. trauma that happened to me as a kid that I had mm -hmm. paved over with achievement and excellence and making money and doing all this stuff and being a sure. mom and all of these things. I paved, paved, paved over it. And I had had a lot of positive reinforcement in my life for all of those things that I had done, but I had never dealt with those issues. Right. So this person was triggering some things inside of me that were like deep, 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 deep down. And the biggest underlying assumption that I had that I had to confront that over that series of weeks actually was recognizing that I had a false assumption that I was all I was going to be at 30. That I had, not that I had it all going on, but that I had like, I like my achievement was who I was. So I had done all of this. So obviously I'm, I'm good. You know, like, so the imposter syndrome that we were talking about before, it wasn't that I no longer felt like an imposter because every time I showed up to a new project, I still felt like, what is a, what is a airflow? Like I still felt all of that, but like, I knew I had this deep confidence in myself that I could overcome, that I could achieve, that I could do this. And it was by, you know, Christ who strengthens me and all that. So it wasn't like it was me, 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 but I, I didn't think that I had to do the work. I didn't think that I had to do the work, the deep, deep down work. I also did this thing called spiritual bypassing. And for any, anyone on the call that may be mad about this, I did a lot of applying the blood of Jesus to my life and thinking that that was absolutely enough and that I didn't have to feel the pain and that I had have to do the thing because Jesus did it for me. And I'm, I'm not, you, I'm that not, is so the truth. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to like come at anybody's theology, but I am saying that like there is, there are, I'm going to be using that. <laughs> there are deep down things that we still have to deal with. I believe we still have to deal with. One that I believe we still percent. have to surrender. Because if, right. we, if we treat the salvation experience, for those who believe in it, that like this, like, okay, Jesus, I'm going to hang on to all my pain like this. And then you just wash me with the blood. You know, I'm going to just hang on right here. Here's my pain. You just wash me, wash over me. <laughs> just Who keep washing over. For? Who is that working for? Nobody. <laughs> it's not even working for Jesus. He's right. not like, right. I got this. <laughs> right. No. He's so like, we but have I want to, I want to help you with that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's get to that. Let's get to right. that. He's just, and he's waiting or, you know, right. the spirit is waiting or whatever until we're yeah. ready. And so I had to get down into some of that stuff. And so I began to get into some of that stuff and I began to unpack some things that were hard to unpack that were like real base level trauma level stuff that was like, what, what, wow. This was, you know, stuff that really, now, that is now a spiritual practice in my life. I'm not done with it yet. I'm, this is, that was 12 years ago. I'm still working. Still, I'm still working. So but, I now, but, now it's, but now it's a practice and a habit and a routine. Now I don't wait. The, the end of that story is that I spent the next few weeks listening deeply to my, to my own, like, what is going on with me that causes me to react to this person that's hampering my leadership and ability to, make, to get this done. The very next day, my energetic attitude toward this person changed the entire sh dynamic of our daily meeting. He was, not, he was not antagonistic toward me. He was not trying to correct me. And I didn't say anything different. I just showed up different. Um, I can't say we became best friends, but over the course of that project, he became an ally and someone who really, really helped and did his job and was amazing and, and got it done because I chose to show up differently and stop using all my energy for the ridiculous, like, look at go, he's so blah, blah, blah. Oh like God. that is just an energy suck. It is a temptation. It is a lie. It is a fraud. When we, when, and there's any change that is happening in your life, any change that is happening in your life, whether it is personal, like I realized that I could not read the top of the instant pot last night because personally my eyes are not what they used to be. And I was like, I can read it. Right, right, right. <laughs> Just bring it a little closer. Actually, I need it a little further away. Does like anybody I, have a magnifying glass so I can hold changed, it far away? Yeah. Who changed the font on my instant it's, pot? It's, I, um, that hasn't happened to me, but I see it happen to my husband. He, like, hands stuff over to me all the time. He's like, can you read that? I'm like... <laughs> Wow. Okay. Right. So whether it's a personal change that's, that's coming up in you, a familial, yeah. familial change of something that's happening with your immediate family, a social or professional change that's happening with groups or, or a job or a client that you're a part of, or cultural change, which is what we're experiencing now, or all of them. Right. Whenever all of that change is happening and we spend all of our energy only mad about the change and not taking that time to go down and say, what is it about this change that is hitting me and how can I own that and reevaluate and take a look and say, 
what is the thing down here that I still, because every change is an opportunity. Every change is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for you to grow, mm -hmm. for you to heal, and for you to prosper. There is always an opportunity, no matter what it is that is happening inside you, that if you can get into the place where you can heal and grow from that whatever thing that is triggering you and making you mad about it, then you, you have an opportunity. When you grow and when you heal, you automatically step into positions where you are attracting prosperity to yourself. You are attracting opportunity to yourself. You are attracting new, <clears throat> new levels to yourself because you are willing to let go of some deep thing inside of you. You said so, nothing different, but you showed up differently. I showed up You no longer were showing up with the energy of focusing on how do I get this brother to shut the hell up and get out of yeah. here. Yeah. You, folk, you came in with the energy of, A, hey, now I understand what he, where he hits me. Yeah. And I understand that that's not truth. Yep. So I'm, I'm showing up to do my job like I want to every day. And that shift of energy, isn't that, energy is a powerful thing. Mm. Because what you just said is that shifting your energy, you actually shifted, it changed your life. It changed yes, it your did. life with regards to that guy. Because yes. how you behave, so first, how you perceive is how you then behave. Mm -hmm. How you behave, show, it, it actually uh, speaks to the choices and the decisions you make. Mm -hmm. And then it speaks to how other people respond to you. And there is the cycle of how your life feels. Right. So if you change your perception, which is the work that you did, you change yes. your perception. So now you went in with clarity. So mm -hmm. now you went in making different choices and interfacing with them differently. And you changed the whole temperature of the room mm -hmm. and subsequently your life. Yes. Yes. Isn't that powerful? Within a matter of weeks, I had people who I never really interfaced with coming up to me and saying, there's kind of like a real change in you. I, like people saying, I, I don't know what's going on in your, on your team anymore, but you guys are like killing it. What's going on? So we had a, a board where all these teams were being tracked and my board like shot to the top in terms of productivity and everything. So me taking my attention away from that internal conflict with him and being all blah, 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 and actually working on myself not only benefited my relationship with him, made that meeting better, but it made our entire team better and caught the attention of another contractor who ended up inviting me to bid later on for the first contract that I had in the business that I now have 12 years later that I make six figures in. So right. that, that, I'm that your cousin Bebe, we got that. <laughs> so I'm going to be borrowing money later. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so, I, um, so what I'm saying is that when we waste all of our energy in this churn of, of just this agitated churn, just this like, gah, 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 gah. like I'm mad about this. And now they're, they used to say this and now they want us to say this. And oh, then we're doing this and we can't have this flag. And we got over here and Aunt Jemima is not a thing anymore. And all this stuff, we got to have the thing. And oh my gosh, we can't watch Paw Patrol. And like all of these just chattery, chattery things where we're so mad. There's all of this rapid change. That is all stimuli that is hitting you, but you need to take some time Ooh. to go deep. And it, it, it is the most work and it is no work at all because all of the thing that you think this is hard work, this is hard work. All of that is just resistance. It is just you resisting, resisting. And the question is why resisting. are you resisting it? Yeah. What re you resist persists. So mm -hmm. you just keep resisting. No, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Now that's where it goes back to what you were saying. I had this the thing that I wanted, the thing that was normal for me, the thermometer, the barometer for me was that I needed something to complain about. Right. I, need, I needed something. I had a disappointment addiction. I needed something to be disappointed about. Right. Because so we'll create that in our life. Like, that's yes. the thing. We're like, we'll create a whole bunch of shit to yeah. be disappointed of so we can talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And for me, it and, also, we, and also so we can come back from it if that's yes. what we're used to doing. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And Part of it for me, because I'm socially awkward, or I used to be, I used to think of myself as socially awkward. Uh, yeah, that's a plurality of experience. Because <laughs> I don't, I don't, Was that, I don't perceive I, you as being socially awkward. Well, I am, I am a recovering workaholic. And at that time, I was in full, full born alcohol, alcoholic. You were off I'm the not wagon. an alcoholic. You were off the wagon. I was full bore workaholic still yeah. at that point in my life. And I, um, the only context that I had for socialization was talking about work. So I would look for, con I didn't realize I was doing it, but sometimes I would look for conflict and, and over-exaggerate conflict within the project team to, to give me something to talk to someone about. And then I was like, that sucks. Like, who does that? That's a terrible thing. I wouldn't like do it a lot, but I, there would always be someone, 
right? There would always be a, a, a person. And, and from that day, for the rest of my time working on that, con- that company, I didn't have another villain. There was no other villain in my life at that company. I was, at, I was at peace. I, I would have conflict with people and I would immediately like go within and be like, okay, what's, what's going on? <laughs> so, what's going on? And find it. I had more uh, villains later, but not at that company. But not at that company. And, and, yeah. and I'm sure the villain showed up differently. And the mm. next villain hit you in a different yeah, spot. Yeah, there was another, there was another, another level. Yeah, yeah. because yeah. it was a different thing. So because you had already learned that lesson. So the, the thing that this guy hit you on was you are all that you ever will be. Is that where he was hitting you? That, was, that, was, hitting the, you? that was the theme. He actually hit me in several spots. And what was really the, the raw place underneath me was that I was terrified that I was like the shiny, new, cool, like, look at this girl who did this thing. She did that. She made all these eight SOPs in a short amount of time. And she managed this project and they came in on time and she did this. And I was this shiny new thing. And he was super super experienced in his field he had all the degrees and all the pedigrees uh, and, and, and he was older and he had a way about him and I, I still don't know if he really was on board with like a woman being a leader so he was hitting something inside me that was still trying to prove myself as a woman in the workplace because I still yeah. had all that stuff from the early 20s of the women saying you're a Jezebel if you go out to work so it was, it was, he was, repre- he represented someone to me that should have had the job that I had. And so I felt intimidated. I felt, yeah. and I, I jumped on. And you that, thought at some point they're going to figure this out. Yes. Yeah. They're going to figure this out. Yeah. And then they're, they're going to be like, let's get rid of the shiny new and go back to what we know. Yeah. Try mm-hmm. to test it. Try to yeah. test it over there. Exactly. Yes. Okay. That's good. So it's oh a scarce, God. scarcity thing. Okay, I have a few more questions for you because we're getting yes. towards the, I cannot believe, yes. see how an hour goes by so crazy. I know, I know, it's crazy. Um, so what would you say to someone who's in the middle of tons of change right now? They're, and you know, you're speaking to the world, you touched on it with like the Aunt Jemimas and all that. What you're touching on is there's a lot of things that are changing both societally, um, yeah, socially in our largest society and are changing in our personal world. Yes. What would you say to that person who's listening to this, who's encountering tons of change right now? What's the first yeah. thing? What, what would you tell them? The first thing is to accept what is. Mm-hmm. Now, this is the thing that people often like get confused that by accept what is, that that means that you have to agree with what is, or that you have to approve of what is, or that you have to get on board with what is. Right. And really what accept what is means is you just accept what is occurring now right. in this moment right. when we when we expend energy resisting what is and trying to uh-huh. pretend that it doesn't happen or get mad about that it's happening then we lose that energy that we need to actually deal with it so accept what is and mindfulness practice is like so huge in what this is space. mindfulness practice to you so mindfulness practice is observing what is zooming out meditation however you want to phrase it but it's observing what is in a non-judgmental and non-narrative based way Mm -hmm. so instead of saying you know like okay let's say i got stung by a bee which i haven't in a long time so okay we're not going to say that say i got stung by a bee right um accepting what is is yes you react in pain it hurts it's it's difficult but to accept it what is is i have been stung by a bee that is accepting what is to create narrative around it or to have judgment around is why are these bees always stinging me? Damn bees. Right? Like that the mm-hmm. bees are on a personal mission to against get you. you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And if you hadn't been there, then the bee wouldn't see. It's the whole situation. I wish you would you, if right. you had been inside or, what you thought. Right. Or if my husband had taken care of these bees, I wouldn't get stung. Or, that's exactly you know, right. So that's actually step two of, you know, accept what is and then discern fact from fiction. So we are. <laughs> I love that. Discern fact from fiction. So we are meaning making machines and we will always do that. We will always try to make meaning out of some experience that we've had. We try to make meaning around an emotional experience, meaning around a painful experience, meaning around change. And that's natural. And it's not, that's why I say discern between it. So I don't know if anybody's reached the level of egolessness where they no longer make meaning. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, right, right, right. maybe there are a few, but discerning between the two and recognizing this is fact. The fact is I've been stung by a bee. Now, if I've been stung by a bee and I just walk around my deck for 25 minutes complaining about my husband not taking down the, the beehive, I am now stuck in the fiction. I'm stuck right. in the narrative. I am so obsessed with the narrative 
And then the third thing is to engage with inspired action. So like, what is the thing I need to do? What is the thing I need to do? The thing I need to do is give myself some first aid. And if I'm allergic to bee stings, maybe I need to call 911. But like, I have some things I need to do and to just walk around and be mad about the fiction that you created. And what did you call that? Engage in? Inspired action. So inspired I used to, action. I used to just be like, take action. Mm -hmm. But inspired action to me is that thing that you develop over time where you begin to really get to know yourself and what's going on with you. And in that deep secret place, you begin to hear the divine word and begin to understand what the, ins you, you know, the difference between the inspired action and the ego action, because there might be a take action that's just like, I'm going to storm mm -hmm. upstairs and wake up my husband who works three, third shift and yell at him for taking that. Like, that's not inspired action. That's, in that's action. But now there's a tail. Inspired. Yeah, there's a tail into this, and that is feel your feelings. So you got to, in this, this other stuff of like looking down and getting into your like your identity and all that kind of stuff, you need to preserve time to actually feel your feelings. Like if you are upset or angry about the bee sting, if you are upset or angry about all the things, like take the time away from all of that madness of social media and all of that blah, 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 and let yourself feel it. Let yourself feel sad. Let yourself feel angry. Let yourself feel all of those things, yeah. and they will pass. They, they will. will pass if you let yourself feel them. But Absolutely. if you just if you just put them in a bubble and say, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to block them. I'm just going to be yeah. mad about them. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to feel them. I'm just going to be mad about the fact that I have feelings about this. And right. I put this bubble around it. I'm just going to be mad about the feel. See, see, this, see this globe of feelings that I have? I have all these feelings about the, all this change that are happening. I'm not going to feel them. I'm just going to keep letting them grow until this thing explodes. Uh -huh. that, yeah, yeah, and I, I, I know we're almost over, but that also is the the perfect stuff to become to become an awful 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 human being mm -hmm. you know what i mean it really like if you keep if you if you don't live a life of mindfulness if you're not allowing yourself to feel the feelings if you're not taking inspired action if you're not discerning fact from fiction if you stay in that place of um covering up not feeling being mad about what you feel not being present in the moment you are awful human being you yes. will be, and more importantly you are a sad human being you know that's actually where i go to when people are jackasses to me my first thing is shit must not be going well for them they are <laughs> they have a lot of something yeah. going wrong that they're not dealing with because it yeah. comes out you know it comes yes. out and so i have one bookend give it plurality of experience mm -hmm. when you take it personally that you see someone has done something or a company has done something or so, some, at some level, something has been done to you and you're mad and you take it personally, keep in mind that that actual person is having a different experience mm -hmm. than you are. So the, the flip side is also true. So when we look at some, what someone else has done to us and we, we narrate it and we take it personally, recognize that that person still exists and is having a different experience than you. And they might have had zero intent to hurt your feelings. They may have had zero intent to create change that caused all this chaos. It is on right. you. It is on you as a human being in 2020 yes. to show up for yourself and do the deep work that you need to do and stop blaming everybody else for all of the change that is affecting your precious you level. We have to get <laughs> plurality of experience. It works both ways. No, that's what I'm ways. seeing. You say, like, if you're having plurality experience with your own self, know that the other person is too, and give right. them that grace. Yep. Okay, we have yep. less than two minutes. I okay. have a couple questions for you. Mm. What sound or noise do you love in the spirit of James Lipton? Uh, the wind. The wind. The wind through the trees in my backyard. The wind. I love that. What sound or noise don't you love? Ooh. Um, I have synesthesia, so I hear and feel... I feel what I hear and it's the sound of shame, someone shaming uh -huh. someone else because there's a very specific frequency that happens when shaming is happening and that Ooh. sound, that sound gets like me. It. Nope. I don't know if I could tell the difference, but I don't like that sound either. <laughs> um, what's your favorite curse word? <laughs> I can't say this on, on this, Shay. I can't say this on <laughs> that, Shay. Tell me what it begins with. It starts with an F. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Last question. Yes. Beautiful is, if heaven exists, what do you want God to say when you get there? Hey, I know you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh my gosh, Liz. Thank you for sharing space and time with me. I love you. You're brilliant. Thank you for sharing your genius with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me.